For those of you that perhaps don't know me, I'm Claire. I'm the Compassion, Justice and Missions Pastor here at Verso. And we have been in a season of looking at mission, the dream topic for such a person as me. Um, And today is our final week. Um, We've been looking at what it means to, um, to birth mission out of a place of knowing Jesus We've been looking at the what and how and the why of mission. And if you haven't been here for any of those, I really encourage you to go back and catch up because it really is a sequence that builds upon um, week by week. So do go back online and catch up on those series um, up to this point. But we've been having our eyes opened, I think, haven't we, as a church, around what it means to love God and reach the lost even to the ends of the earth. And last week, I shared that we're going to be partnering with OMT in the Himalayas um, and, and adopting the Kosh Rajbanji people group, seeing the word of God come alive in their heart language so that they have the opportunity to hear about the good news of Jesus. And we've looked at what it means to reach the lost through family, through our vineyard family and going to Sri Lanka and partnering with churches here in the UK to empower and equip what God is doing through vineyard in Sri Lanka. And today, you may have noticed, if you've been tracking with us, that we have one final part of our framework to unpack. Um, So we've been looking at the framework in Acts 1.8, where Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we've done the ends of the earth. We've done Judea and Samaria. And today, we're going to be looking at what our Jerusalem is. And you might remember, but we talked about this at the very beginning, our Jerusalem Jerusalem in their context was the streets that they literally walked on. It was their local setting. And so for us, when we look at this framework this morning, we're just going to briefly talk a little bit about our local setting, the places that we walk, the places that we encounter every day, the people in the places that we find ourselves. Because Jesus reminded them that you're to go there too, right? When he gave us the Great Commission, go into all nations, that includes our own nation right here where we are. But I love that he says that we're to go into even our own nation. There is a sense of action and movement, not uh, kind of, well, I'm here and I'll just see what God does because I'm here. There's an intentionality to even our local setting and the people that we encounter. So I want us to open up the scripture this morning. We're going to look at Mark 12, verses 28 to 33. Straighten my, (laughs) straighten this up. Really famous scripture. And in fact, if you want to delve deeply into this, because I'm not going to go super deep into it this morning, you can go back and listen to Mark's teaching from before the summer where he spoke on this passage. But it says this, Jesus answered, the most important is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one, and there is no one beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all of the strength and to love one neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I love this passage. I love that this passage once again demonstrates what we have been unpacking in the story of God. First, we are reminded, and this is my hope in this series, that you will never forget this, that we are first always, always, always called to love God. He is our first love, the one that we run after. I don't want you to walk out of this mission series ever thinking that we run after mission. We don't run after mission. We run after God and mission results 
coming out of that place. And notice the order of these two greatest commandments that Jesus says, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I love that when the Bible puts loving God in the context of a command, what we see here is that it is our love for him that becomes the galvanating force, the strength within us. But not how we, just how we feel about God in our heart, but it ignites our thoughts about him, our mind. And it stimulates our desires for him, our soul. And all of those things lead to movement, to action. Loving God motivates our every decision and empowers our every action. And it's why he commissions us out of this loving relationship with him. Because as we start to run after him and only him, we start to see ourselves as he sees us. We start to see the beautiful creation that he put in each one of us. And we learn to love ourselves. And when we love ourselves, we can love our neighbor freely, without condition, without expectation of something in return. You know, that neighbor that's really noisy and annoys you. Or the one who's really grumpy and a bit harsh and set in their ways. Or perhaps the one whose heart just seems so hard and there's not a chance this person's ever going to be interested in Jesus. You're called to love them. But not out of striving, not out of forcing yourself out of a place of loving God and when we understand his love and the, what he's done for us, the overflow is that we are willing to just keep loving and keep loving and keep loving and keep loving because we're not responsible for the outcome. We're just responsible to love. And secondly, in the scripture, as we love God, it's here that we see, as I said, those things that he's placed in each one of us. And we're reminded afresh this morning that there's not one of us in this room that is not designed for mission. Why? Because every one of us in here, whether we know it or not, is designed to be in relationship with God. That's how he created every human being on this earth, was to be in relationship with him. And as we say yes to that relationship, the overflow is that we're invited to step in and participate in his story and take up our position that he has uniquely crafted for each of you to do. Everyone gets to play. That's what the vineyard says. It's true, guys. It's true. Everyone gets to play. No one has the monopoly on the work of the kingdom. We're all his disciples and we all get to play a part. Because in each of us, when we've said yes to Jesus, we have been given everything of worth for eternity. And in the giving and the receiving of that, we are compelled to give it away. Each one of us is designed to be used in God's kingdom for his glory, for stewarding his story on the earth here in 2024, for the purpose of bringing every person, every people group, people groups exist in the UK, every nation, every tribe, into that life-giving, transformational opportunity to be in relationship with our Creator, our Father, the one who intimately knows each one of us and in whom every solution can be found. We are blessed, as it says in Genesis, to be a blessing. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. I will bless you, God says to Abraham, and you will be a blessing and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so we start to understand, and I, I know I'm just kind of refreshing our memories in here this morning. This is not new stuff. We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves because every person on this earth is designed for relationship with God. Inside every person, whether they know it or not, there is a longing that is crafted by God in heaven and only satisfied 
in a place of knowing him. And you and I get the absolute privilege of being his tangible hands and feet on this earth. And you may be the only person your neighbor has ever gonna, is ever going to encounter that can open up the joy it is to know Jesus. And the enemy would absolutely love to convince you otherwise. You know, I was thinking about the culture that we live in. We talked about it last week a little bit. But I think when we, I think, in fact, I, I heard a guy speaking on our theology classes recently about the kingdom of God and how the extremes sit in utopia and defeatism. And how Christians sit themselves in this kind of framework. And often... The the, the middle is Jesus, right? Heaven is the end result. Eternity, wonder, communion, where no pain, no no injustice, all of that exists is utopia, if you want to use that term, but it's not, you you know, it's the kingdom, that's it fulfilled. The opposite extreme is to believe that we live in a world that no one really is interested in this, that we, we sit in a defeatist mentality that that, okay, we know this is true, but you know what? Nobody really wants to find out about it. And if I'm honest, I think as a church in the Western church, we've sat a little bit too close to this side of the defeatist. We've started to believe that the world is too hard, that the UK is so secular, nobody wants to hear about Jesus. And we're too scared to tell our neighbor about him. But I want to tell us this morning that God is on the move. He really is on the move in the UK. He is alive, he's active, he's in pursuit of every person in this country. And and if you don't believe me, I want to encourage you to go and look up this research. Talking Jesus was done by the Evangelical Alliance. It is a phenomenal piece of research about the reality of where the UK is at. And and they said that in here, 75% of non-Christians felt really comfortable having conversations about faith. That's phenomenal. 75% of our country wants and has a longing for conversation that is comfortable to them about faith. Fusion in the UK did some research in 2024 on young adults. They found that 75% of young adults would say yes to coming to church if someone invited them. 75% would say yes. And you know what? When those people that accepted Jesus, when they gave their feedback, they said, you know what? It's really astonishing to me is that nobody told me about this good news before. Why did they not share it? Why didn't you share it with me? How could you hold this back from me? There are phenomenal stories. I was just literally talking and I grabbed uh, Elise, who I uh, get the joy of walking with and journeying together with. And she encourages me almost weekly when I meet up with her with these stories about her workplace. And I said to her, can you give me a story? Can you give me a story? And to encourage us. And she said that um, she, was, she works in London and she was um, feeling a little bit discriminated in her workplace for being Christian. So she went to her director and expressed this and um, probably with some fear and trepidation, I would imagine. Um, <laughs> and what looked like a, an opportunity that could go really wrong ultimately resulted in this. Her director was like, you know what, I just, I feel actually quite, um, I feel quite jealous of people who have a faith, who seem to have this light that is leading them. And the end result of this conversation is that that director of this company wants a monthly meeting with Elise to talk about faith. Like that is the stuff, God is on the move, he, and that is loving your neighbor. Because love isn't just showing up and being kind, love is speaking truth right? Love is truth and grace. It's about showing up as you are in Christ, knowing who you are and being that person in all places. And sometimes that means saying hard things, but look at the fruit of being bold enough to say that. There is all kinds of stories going on. Talk to anyone in Verso Care. We had an amazing story this week about a transformation of an individual through the bridge program. God is on the move. He's on the move, and we need to believe it in this place. And so Verso has always been missional. And I, and, and I hope in this series you don't think we, we are talking like we haven't been doing missional things. We have always been missional. For 36, 37 years, 
You know, if I talked to Chris and Fliss, I guarantee that we would be here all morning listening to the stories of Jesus encountering people in this town. We are the result of those stories. It started as a small group, and look at the size of our church now. This is all people encountering Jesus, right? We have seen a story unfold in Verso Care. Verso Care, believe it or not, if you don't know what Verso Care is because you're new here, guess what? Today you get to find out. We have a tour between our services, and I want to encourage you, whether you are brand new and you have no idea what I'm talking about, or if you've been here for 30 years, Verso Care is a part of us in this room. And, and going and hearing the stories and seeing what God is doing will literally inspire your faith. So sign up to that tour. But Verso Care started in a, a, essentially a bunker in the car park. Now we have this incredible purpose-built space over here that we get to welcome people ex- experiencing poverty and injustice into our midst. We get to show them the, the tools and the support they need to just take the next step to thriving in their life. And we get to introduce them to Jesus. And there are stories. Endlessly, that has been part of our whole story here as Verso. So do go and find out if you want to be inspired this morning. We also have been, in recent times, we've become a multi-site church. What is that about? That's about reaching, extending our reach to reach the lost. We recognize that people in Hemel might not want to come to St. Albans. We need to go to Hemel to show Jesus in that place. We're in Hatfield. We're going to Luton. This is missional. And we want to say to you, Verso, that we want you to get behind our missional expression. So for some of you, those people that have stepped out to lead those things, they are stepping out of the comfortable place of this room and giving their yes to Jesus to reach the lost in those places. And we have an opportunity to ask God what our place is in that. And so for some of you in this room, I believe the Lord's going to speak to you about our sites. And he's going to say, you know what? Give me six months. We want to say to you, you have permission in this room to not show up here on Sunday and to go to Hemel or to Luton or to Hatfield and give of yourself to serve those sites for six months and, and see it as your mission to serve and do whatever is needed for that team that is going to make their job easier to make it help them to get off on the right feet. And it doesn't matter how long it's been going. You can keep going. Hatfield will take you, I promise. If you want to go to Hatfield for six months and serve them, they will love it. And you will get those granular stories of faith that will change you and will inspire you. But as we've looked at this as a church and we recognize that we have been missional in our local setting, and many of you will have phenomenal stories of things that are happening in your everyday life. Number one, I want to say this. We need to tell those stories, share those stories. It's a gift of faith when we hear the stories. And it, it empowers us and it, and it helps us to keep going. But as we've thought about this context for us as a church in this hour, the word that I kept hearing from the Lord was increased mobilization of the one. And I think there is an invitation of the Lord in this season for us all to choose to say yes to Jesus with a bit more intentionality in our everyday lives. And so as we've looked at what that could look like for us, um, we are going to be doing something in 2025 to help us in that. We know it's not easy. We know our lives are busy. But we want to be a people that go on mission with intentionality, whether it's on our doorstep or to the Himalayas. And so we're going to be launching something called Love Your Street 25. (laughs) Wow, you sound so excited. (laughs) It is okay. You're like, Claire, what are you talking about? (laughs) It's okay. Don't panic. Don't panic. I I can hear you. You're like, oh, no, this is more rotors. This is more people needs. Guess what? We're not running anything in this building for Love Your Street 25. The whole heart behind Love Your Street 25 is that every one of us gets to take our place right where we are. You can do it right in your home. You can do it on your doorstep. You can do it in your workplace. You can do it in the places that you already are. This isn't about adding something to make your life busier. It's about bringing focus to where you are and encouraging you to show up fully as a disciple of Jesus in the places that you live and you work and you have your being. And to just 
step in and choose. So we're going to have basically, Love Your Street 25 is going to look like a month of intentional, like going all in to be a blessing to the places that you live. And it's up to you what that looks like. You can do it as an individual, you can do it as a group, you can do it with your friends, you can do it with your family. But I want you to ask the Lord in the next kind of six months, what is it that I could do to be a blessing in the place that I am to show a little bit of something of who God is? And it might look like you taking the mums that you're at a playgroup with and saying, you know, well, after playgroup today, we're going to have coffee, or we're going to go out tonight, and I'm just going to intentionally love this group. It might be that you want to throw a street party. It might be that you want to actually bless your street by cleaning it up and going out with a group and cleaning it and doing a litter pick. And when people ask you why you're bothering to do that, you get into conversations and you say, I love our community and I love the environment. And this is an expression of who God is. It might be that you want to go out and do some healing on the streets or some prayer treasure hunts. I don't know what it's going to look like. Because it's you guys doing it. It's not us coming up with the idea. It's about you doing it in your place. And we're going to add some fun. We're going to put a little challenge on it for us because, you know, mission is fun. It's not all serious. Um, And we're going to set a target of doing 2,000 hours of mission in one month as a church across all of our sites. And we're going to celebrate, guys. We're going to have a party. We're going to have a celebration. And we're going to celebrate what God is going to do through each of us. And I just want to encourage you, like, whether you feel like you can talk about Jesus or not, whether you feel like you have the tools in your hand or not, God moves in our everyday. And I was just reminded, as just as I finish, a quick story. I was reminded just last year of, we don't understand sometimes the fruit of sowing seeds for a very long time. But I, when my kids were little, I was a stay-at-home mum, and it meant I had the privilege to walk to a playground every day in both morning and afternoon. And I didn't have to rush off to a job. Um, And essentially, in hindsight, what I realized is that I became a pastor on that playground just by showing up with my kids. Not not because I was telling them all about Jesus all the time, but because I was being a mum who could just listen, who could walk with other mums, who could see them in their their best and their worst. And I would just constantly be faithful. And and I I didn't hide my faith, but I didn't, I wasn't like blasting out like, you're a sinner, <laughs> you know, like, um, but I share my stories, and, and just last year, this is almost, what, 10, 12 years later, one of those mums reached out to me on Facebook, and she said to me, you know what, she was having a crisis, and she said, you know what, Claire, you're the only person I know who has navigated difficult things with a different position than anyone else I know. Would you pray for me? This is happening, and I thought, wow. God, wow, you, you lead us to show your love and, to, and just be who we are, the light of Jesus in us, wherever we are, and he's faithful to unpack the rest. Bless you, Claire. Thank you. Claire and I are doing a bit of a tag team on this. Thank you, Tony. Uh, it's just so exciting what the Lord is doing in our midst. And, um, you know, as Claire said, our story as a church for 36 years has been a story of, of mission and a story of change. It's, it's in our DNA. And I just want to talk about that a bit as we wrap up this series and as we prepare to worship, which I can't wait to do. Um, I want to talk about change and the season that we're in and how we should respond to that. You see, firstly, I recognize that people respond to change in very different ways. Um, For some, change is a great thing. In fact, you thrive on change. Uh, You can get bored if there isn't change. And in fact, if, if the church isn't doing stuff, you feel like the church should be doing more. Um... But for some, change, or should I say continual change, uh, can feel a bit disorientating, uh, maybe a bit disconcerting for some. And, and I recognize, having conversations with some, that for some, that's you know, a feeling that they may feel in this season. You know, over the past six years, n- next year I would have been the senior pastor for seven years. Um, what a journey, what a ride. Um, 
And, you know, over the past six years, we've pushed into multi-sites, we've launched the REACH initiatives, we've had a new name, worship has been evolving, and now missions, to name a few. And for some, the question may be, why change, or, or why so much change? Well, there's just one thing after the next, after the next. And the answer really is this, that the church is an organism. The church is the body of Christ. And we should expect change. We should expect movement. We should expect that the Lord is constantly going to be speaking and moving us into new seasons. And we should always be asking the Lord, what should we be doing in this season? What do we change? I've had some questions about uh, Bethesda. And if you've missed... um, Uh, The communication about that, after 26 years, we felt led of the Lord that it was time to end that partnership as we explored what mission would look like in this season. I've had some people ask questions such as, did something happen there that went wrong? Uh, Is there another story there? I want to say the story is this. Jesus said, you were faithful in that season. I've got something next for you. And we were diligent in that process of seeking the Lord and and counsel, both within the church and within Vineyard UK. And as I communicated, we didn't just pull out overnight. We committed to a funding plan of two years with Bethesda. And we honor the relationship with them, and we're grateful for that season that was. But, you know, as a church, we need to recognize that God is going to call us continually to new things. I, you know, one of the things that Steph and I were so attracted to about coming to this church, and we felt at home, and uh, Claire has referenced our founding pastors, Chris and Fliss Lane, was that change was just in their DNA and in the DNA of this church. And that excited us to be part of a church that was on the move and, 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 and seeking the Lord. And so we're doing what we've always done, church, which is this, what have you got for us next? And our mission, uh, this next chapter in mission is a result of seeking the Lord. And that leads me to the second point that I want to make, really, which is how do we approach seeking the Lord and discerning how we respond to change? And I've had some questions about that, and they're great questions. Uh, You'll be pleased to know, I think, that the staff team doesn't wait for me to go up to a mountain and come back with a plan. As a body of believers... We pray together within the staff, within the senior leadership of the staff. We have an executive team of pastors who meet as well. We have conversations with the staff. We seek the Lord. We pray, as I said. We have conversations with some of you relevant team leaders in different areas of church. We pray with our trustees. We uh, have counsel and pray with Vineyard UK and Ireland. And so whenever we approach a change like this, we, we don't just say, right, let's go. We discern, we seek the Lord. I was reminded as I was thinking about this of, um, uh, of, of, a, of something that happened, in, 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 you can read about in the book of Acts, where the apostles write a letter to the believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. And there's a really fascinating line in the letter, and it says in Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I love that. It's a really good summary of a discernment process. You know, it wasn't like a letter that I received written from the Lord. You know, it wasn't necessarily a dream, and those things do happen. It was, you know what, we sought the Lord, we prayed together, and it seemed good to us. There was unity of spirit, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And you see, that is how I believe a church should respond to change, and is how we should operate as a body of believers. And so that has been this new direction in mission, which represents another large change for us as a church and a very exciting change. Why is it exciting? Because it shows that God hasn't finished with us yet. Isn't it exciting when God says, I want to lay this massive thing in front of you because I believe in you and I'm cheering you on? Isn't that exciting? It's exciting because God says, you've been faithful in that which I've given you thus far. I'm now going to give you more. Isn't that exciting? I mean, that's a kingdom principle, isn't it? If you're faithful in the small things, God will give you more. So our expectation as a church should be that God is going to give us more and more as we are faithful in that which God has given us. And so I am grateful to God that we are part of a church that gets to be on the move and that God hasn't finished with us yet. 
And so, church, I want to uh, point out this you would have received on your chair. This is a flyer. This says one mission. And on the back, some information, but you'll see a QR code. That will take you to what is a brand new missions hub on our website. You can eat, also, you can type in verso.church forward slash missions. And within that, you will find all the information that we've looked at. Questions, there's an FAQ section on there. It breaks out what God is calling us to do. It looks at the local, the near, and the far. There's also an opportunity for you to respond and say, I want to be part of this. And there's opportunities to fill in forms. One area I want to just reference and highlight is what Claire said about multi-site. You know, Claire and I and Richard Gathard, who uh, helps facilitate and oversee uh, our multi-sites, we've been really seeking the Lord about how we can be really be more intentional about as a church to see our multi-sites as a missional opportunity. And so I want to encourage you um, to say, listen, if you live in Hatfield or if you live in Hemel, and when we launch Luton next year. The question should be, Lord, are you calling me into mission? Because, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And what we're asking you is to consider whether you can say, for six months, I'm going to go on a mission trip to Hatfield, because that's right on my street. Or, I live in Hemel, and so for six months, I'm going to commit to being a missionary on my doorstep. And I tell you something, as Claire said, you are going to be so blessed in that. The stories that you will see, being part of something so wonderful. So on verso.church forward slash missions, there was an opportunity for you to say, yep, yeah, I'd like to find out more about that. I want to end with this. This is a moment, church, where the Lord is calling us to go deeper. You know, we talked a lot about the things we're going to do, but I'll be frank, it's less about what we are doing for the Lord and more about what the Lord is doing in us. Really. I mean, like, he doesn't, technically he doesn't need us. I mean, he could, you know, he could do that. He's very powerful. <laughs> but he chooses to partner with us. But he chooses to partner with us because he wants relationship with us and he wants, us to, conform, he wants to conform us to the likeness of his son. And so this invitation to do mission is an invitation to go deeper with him and say, Lord, would you have your way with me? And that's really exciting. So how should we respond in this moment? Well, I'm going to invite the band up as I end. We need an encounter with Jesus. I mean, Claire said it every week. It comes out of that relationship with him and say, Lord, send me. I'm yours. When we experience the majesty and the awe and the holiness of God, our creator, we say, I am yours. You've paid a price. I'm a bond servant. That means we're his. Have your way with me. When the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 1, listen, brothers and sisters, in light of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, that wasn't hyperbole. That was a direction to say, it ain't your life anymore. Offer it. Like, strap yourself to the altar and say, Lord, have your way with me. I mean, if you, listen, the way of the Lord is through a narrow gate and the way is narrow. Like, if we are committed to being followers of Jesus, then a, then a place of maturity and relationship with him is recognizing that it's all for him. And we are not our own. And you know, that story of Isaiah where he encounters God and he says, woe is me, I am undone. And God says, who will go? And he says, send me. Like, uh, yeah, send me. And I don't know about you, but what stirred in my heart through this whole mission series is, yes, I've been excited about the opportunity. Yes, I can't wait to get involved and to spread the love of Jesus to those that don't yet know him. But I'm also excited about the fact that God is wanting to do something deep in me. And that should excite you. That should challenge all of us. And so we want to spend time now in worship and we're going to have some ministry time as well. At some point we're going to get up and we're going to say, let's pray for each other in the room. Let's love our neighbor like the person sitting next to you. We're going to pray for each other. But in this holy moment, my heart's desire for myself and for us as a church is that we would encounter the living God. And so church, can I invite you to stand as I pray as we prepare our hearts to worship?